And I think, you know, listening to her in the back of the bus, there were several times where I got the, you know, the, the pinpricks up the back of my yeah. head. Yeah, that, that's the time. That phrasing, you know, and I, right. and I definitely found that on stage as well. And for, for me personally, when a musician can tap in to my spirit directly like that and, and cause a, a physical reaction, that's, that's being really anointed, right? <laughs> Welcome to another edition of Musicians Reveal. I'm Joe Kelly, and I'm extremely excited this afternoon as we're going to talk to a world-class musician, saxophonist. He plays a lot of other different instruments, produces, traveled all over the world to perform for his own music and with other bands. He was a member of Amy Winehouse's band and also has joined the stage with Beverly Knight, Bob Geldof, Prince, and Maceo Parker, Wow, that's a lot. That's a lot for a career. And uh, I'm really excited to welcome right here, Musicians Reveal, Aaron Liddard. Liddard or Liddard? Uh, Liddard, or, uh, yeah, Liddard, yeah. Okay. So either, either way, thank <laughs> you. Thanks for having me, Joe. Love yeah. To yeah, great to talk with you and, and see you. You're back home in the UK. And tell, tell us how your summer went, because you, you were over here in the States. I was, yeah. So I try, like, I love New York and I love the States. And... Um, I try to get out when I can. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I just spent a couple of weeks in New York. And, and luckily, um, I think the Charlie Parker uh, Jazz Festival was happening while I was there, oh, um, wow. which I'd never witnessed before. To be honest, it's the first time I've been to New York in in August, in summer. Usually I, I usually end up there in, in midwinter mid with like loads of layers of coats on and it's still bitterly yeah. cold. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's like an experiment to go in summer and, and, and check it out. And it's great, isn't it? I mean, as a jazz yeah. musician, New York is um, from, a, you know, from the, in terms of that heritage, it's one of the birthplaces of jazz, right? Right. Oh, yeah. So it's where, where a lot of the evolutions in jazz and therefore the evolutions in modern music mm -hmm. were kind of were triggered in New York. Right. But so it always feels that's got a, a great energy to, to be there as, as a jazz player, you know. And I'm sure you've been to the bitter end, right? Yeah. Yeah. And you, all the pictures on the wall. I mean, you see all the legendary performers, Bob Dylan. So, yeah, you're right. Charlie Parker out there, you know, Miles Davis. You, you said it all. It's got a great tradition. Yeah. And yeah. so uh, I, I guess so I've always liked – you know the, the 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 scene kind of moves around manhattan manhattan's a small place but mm -hmm. but then it's really vibrant and the things you know different decade different areas are more vibey and I, I when i first came was about 20 years ago early noughties and mm -hmm. i remember checking into my hostel grabbing grabbing my horn and getting a subway straight up to harlem and i went straight up to 125th street um to st nick's Oh, wow. Okay. Um, and, and I remember, like, people had said, you know, you're a white guy, watch yourself in Harlem. And I thought, you know, I'm going to go to this place. And I got there, and there were some grumbles on the door. Eh, don't let the little white kid in. Um, <laughs> and they said, look, just go down to the stage end, you'll be fine. And I went down there, and, and it was lovely. They were right. <laughs> yeah. You know, and suddenly I was meeting these guys that really connected to the source straight away. You mm -hmm. know, and I think. I ended up jamming at St. Nick's a couple of times that week. The first time I went down like a lead balloon because I was coming in, you know, they were playing some sort of some bebop and I, I just came in and played some sort of Charlie Parker style bebop. Right. Um, and it was like, I, the vibe was, we don't need that. We don't need you to do that because he lived there. <laughs> We've ah, had that, okay. you know, and it took me a week to realize, and I realized quick, that New York really loves fresh ideas. Mm, yeah. And like a week later, I went down to the same club and I just played f like from my spirit. Right. And wow. they, they were like, okay, you can stay on stage. Yeah. So, so when they see you walking through the club door, they're like, come on, come on, Aaron. 
Oh no, they're next. still like they're, they were still like <laughs> what, what's that white kid doing here? <laughs> Quickly go to the stage. <laughs> yeah. did, did you go over to the Apollo Theater at all? To check it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, great yeah I love that place. Yeah. Um, uh, the, I was over in March, and I I went to do you know the um, the National Association of Jazz Musicians? Yeah, yeah. Um, so they had um, their annual fundraiser at the Apollo in, in okay. March, and I was I was I, was, I, I went, and, went and attended that. That was an interesting yeah. event. So um, so hence yeah. the beginning of the the release of your solo record, critically acclaimed Nylon Man, the NY. Now we know New York. Spent a lot of time there. Have great yeah. friends out there. Now tell us about the the solo record and. Uh, but why don't we get into a little bit of your background and then we'll touch on the solo record, which is outstanding as a oh, musician uh, up in, uh, in hurt, right? Um, say again. Well, you grew up in, is it hurt for sure? Oh, Hertfordshire. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and I, um, I guess my parents are quite, um, a little bit left field, you know, like when I, where I was born was in the cottage with a well and I, it was, in, I was, it, my parents got together in the you know the, the summer of love <laughs> and and so it was early 70s when i was when i came into the world okay. and they would all of their friends they were the first people to kind of of their friend group to get married and have a kid mm. um and so their house became the place that you go to hang so my first few years, I can remember kind of walking around and there's just loads of people hanging out, like a little mini festival. Right. <laughs> so that's kind of my early years. So I already kind of knew what, you know, how, how special it is to have a group of like-minded people knocking around right. from birth, you know, as the, you know, whereas most people probably have a more traditional kind of entrance. Right. And um, I was, I was fortunate to realize that I had a musical affinity. You know, I mean, a caveat to that i believe that everyone is born musical mm -hmm. um and okay some people's brains are wired more for it and i perhaps my brain is wired definitely to hear you know per perceive music i'm lucky it's wired that way um but i think the main thing is the best musicians or well, everyone's born musical and some people are lucky to have been born in an era or a part of the world or to a family where they get to play music okay so, so that's the main thing i'd say that you know my folks were quite liked music and my dad had a piano and so they kind of allowed allowed me to sort of go you know explore music a little bit as a as a little nipper as a little kiddie <laughs> and, um, and your your first instrument i was reading was the tuba right yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's actually the... euphonium, but I I, okay. I couldn't say euphonium, so my <laughs> teacher kindly called it a tuba. <laughs> right. Oops, I just got to check. Yeah. I might have to plug okay. in in a minute. Yeah. yeah so, um, um, so, so tell that us was how... the first official instrument at school. Like I I went for brass lessons, and the guy the guy said, right, try trumpet, and I couldn't. I had asthma, and he, he said, right, you haven't got the puff for trumpet. Um, mm. Do you want to go? Trom trombone's quite hard. Right. Or or tube is quite easy, and I went. I go with the easy one. <laughs> so so yeah, for a few years I'd be carrying, and it was euphonium. It was about this, about okay. you know, about this size. Right. Um, that's my first introduction, and then I think, I think then I did some piano for a few years. But um, you still play uh, a lot of keys as well yourself. Yeah. 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 Like I actually most of the keys on the album is 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 me playing. Right. Okay. Um, and I play, I play in the band. Um, I actually just got my first keys gig. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> there's okay. a, there's, yeah. There's a, a um, R and B artist out here who's just okay. hired me to work work for her, and I'm playing actually not no keys at all. Just sorry, no sax at all. Just keys. Wow. So, so that's hey, that's a compliment to you. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's really sweet. It's nice. Right. Nice, and it, it's nice to be part of the rhythm section, having spent a whole career being a you know the, the kind of on the side of the front line you know <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, so so um just just before we we talk a little more the best website aaronladard.com and yes, also please, yeah. to get all your music you can go to bandcamp as well yeah. good good site. So you can listen to all the tracks and buy the tracks absolutely 
Yeah. Nylon man. Uh, we'll, we'll jump back to your days in Manchester and now presently in, in London, but I wanted to talk about the, the, the solo record nylon man. It's outstanding. And you mentioned different uh, styles. I mean, I heard drum and bass in one of the songs and I love Korean Castaway. I know, I know it's gotta be a favorite cause you, you, you play it live. Um, working with all those different styles and how receptive are your, are your bandmates to it? Very, but I would say it took quite a lot of cajoling oh, to okay. make the record and to to get the right band. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's really, really perceptive of you and it's really great to speak to someone that, that gets, you know, what's going on there. Cause, right, right. But it, it wasn't intentional to have so many genres on the album. I just, um, I kind of... I kind of like I hear I hear ideas in my head, and if if they're ideas that I don't hear in reality, then I consider it kind of almost my duty to try and realise them. Mm -hmm. And having played, been fortunate to play in so many different genres, it's kind of opened my inner ear up to lots of different, you know, ways of making music. I suppose. Um, Did you have a, or do you still have a huge record collection, or or? this collection for music i so, not huge and i i would say that i definitely respond more to hearing music in the flesh oh, okay than, yeah. than listening to recordings while it's you i think that's invaluable um but i get a lot more you know i could hear um a garage band of kids that can't play yet mm -hmm. and i prefer to listen to that than a recording of Miles Davis, and Miles Davis is one of my favorite artists. I, I've so, turned the camera around. I have a huge uh, print of Miles Davis, kind of blue, right in front of me. So, yeah, yeah. I never yeah. saw him play live. I mean, but uh, no, me either. I was lucky to work with one of his musicians, um, Michael Henderson, oh, who played yeah, yeah. bass on on right. Live Evil. Yeah. Um, we spent I, yeah, Go ahead. we spent like a uh, bit three or four months working together. So, so I heard lots of stories. Yeah, so so let's get into what you, you mentioned live bands. I mean, I, I was reading that at one point, were you in Manchester? You were playing with 15 bands at one time here and there? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I mean, I guess the thing about being a horn player is that you tend to get drafted in once a band is up and running, and, mm -hmm. you, and, the, and the horn is... Um, quite applicable to different styles, I suppose. But definitely, yeah. I mean, I was in Manchester for ten years. I absolutely loved it up there. As a uh, coming from the home counties, it was the first time I'd really been released into a, a, a full-on music scene and embraced into it as well. Mm -hmm. And um, within six months of moving there, everyone was booking me for everything. Wow. You know, all of, so I was just doing yeah. lo lots of little little club dates, basically. Um, and you know, sometimes with with bands that were very polished, but a lot of the time with we're just someone's got a gig. And it's mm -hmm. like who can we get? Who's going to be able to run roll with roll with the the bounces? You know, and it's like that new guy. Get that new guy, Aaron. Yeah. Right. Now, uh, now you playing with so many different bands and everything. I wanted to ask you. I'm, I'm not a musician. I didn't have the patience. I only learned one song on the piano, but. Um, Going into gigs like that, is it essential that you have to read music or you can just go on the field? I definitely don't think it's essential to read music, I, but okay. I do think, um, and actually, to be fair, I, I've always been able to read because it's part of my training, mm -hmm. but um, there's two levels to reading. There's being able to sit and work it out at home, and then there's being given a sheet of music and playing it amazingly here, right there and then after the click, you know, sight reading. Okay. And, and the sight reading side, I didn't really get together until after I moved to London. Oh, okay. Um, so I was always able to read, but all of those gigs I was doing in Manchester at, at that time was by, by memory and by listening. Okay, yeah. Um, and if, if there were bands with stuff written right written down, then I'd say, can I take it home and, and learn this? And I, to be honest, I still think that, I think that reading is so good to open up your, the possibilities, mm -hmm. you know, because you can, 
you know, it's amazing. You can get, I had a, a recording session that I ran recently um, and someone wanted to recreate the, the Frank Sinatra sessions, but with more, more power and more, more energy and more fun. Right. And I assembled amazing musicians together, got amazing charts written and put the charts in front of them and count them in. And having never played those arrangements before, they sounded bloody amazing straight away. Right. And that's the wow. power of written music, you know. Mm -hmm. But then you aim to get beyond the right written sheet because the written sheet doesn't, you know, it's great for for pitch and for articulation. It's brilliant. But for for representing rhythm, it's terrible. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, rhythm is, is the, the life force of music a lot of the time. So it's, so it's really important to be able to have your reading to a level where um, you're, you're reading and your ego of reading to a level where you, you, you want to move beyond it. Right. Because it's a great way to learn, but you want to move beyond it and, and start playing, you know, still using your ears and, and playing from from here you know right i think um, about, so yeah definitely yeah. in manchester it's all it's just jam, it's jamming on around ideas right more than more you know more than sitting down and reading stuff now now what what year did you uh head on down to uh london um i think it was oh oh three oh, yeah okay. oh, three. 2003 when yeah. i moved down now one of one of the the biggest uh moments in your career at least pop wise and stuff was uh amy winehouse just a shooting star and an amazing talent um how did you first come to work with uh amy winehouse yeah so um classic thing that it i just happened to kind of meet up with the md at the right time um i'd known dale davis for a few years since moving down because I was lucky enough to meet him at a party and mm -hmm. and then I one of my one of my pupils actually had like a, a work thing and she asked me to put a band together for the work things and I hired Dale and you know we had a band together that I put together and um just by coincidence I just spent my life savings buying a baritone sax Oh wow! And yeah. I and I took the baritone to the gig just for the shit of it, you uh -huh. know. It's like it, the horror, massive big case, like a huge right. case that you know, the flight case, like so heavy. But I was just like, I've got this new horn, I'm going to play it. You know, let's see what right. it goes. You never know what's what. You know what life's going to do for you, right? Right. Um. So I I brought my baritone down to this sort of corporate gig, and um and thought nothing of it and then about two weeks later i got a call from dale um and dale's like um are you busy at the moment and i was like no no uh -huh. it's horrible got nothing okay um are you could you do anything next week um yeah got nothing on next week okay now that that horn you brought down to the gig that was a baritone right yeah do you like it yeah, love it. It's the, it's the first time I've had one. I'm, I'm loving it. Okay, that's cool. And you played tenor. Cool. Right, let me give you a call back. Right, nothing. Didn't know any, any details. And then he called, but called me back a couple of hours later and said, um, do, you, do you play any flute? Yeah, yeah, I've been playing flute since I moved down here. So I'm not amazing at it, but I play it. Okay, cool. Right, um, uh, hold on, I'm going to call you back. <laughs> a couple of hours later, he's like, right, um, I want you to come down next week. The artist is Amy Winehouse. Wow. And so we, we had like a whole week of rehearsals. Um, and, you know, and it's like, I don't know if people sometimes, so, you know, my job or the way I saw it was to listen to the music, learn it all in time for rehearsals. And so when I got to rehearsal, we weren't faffing about with sheets. We were just playing music together, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's always yeah. been my approach with... Um, with the pop stuff is that I try not to take any sheet music into those environments because it's, it's disruptive. So oh, I okay. try to actually learn, learn it. And right. Then, you, then you're coming at it with the right energy, you know, could um, you tell right away that uh, she was something special? I think so. Yeah. I mean, when I joined, she was already at that point, um, gearing up to release the second album, Bats Black. Mm -hmm. And so she was already um, the 
um, priority artist for for her label. Mm -hmm. So the the when an artist in that world gets to that level of priority the it's hard to kind of focus on the music because there's so much business going on around and and it's the, the business stuff is is kind of it's it's all sparkly and getting in the way the whole time right. <laughs> you know? yeah um so it and it was you know and to be honest on that first week worth first week rehearsal she didn't really show up Oh, okay. It was just you Dale know, running the band? She, you know, she'd kind of, she would come, but she'd come like, we'd, we'd be rehearsing from like 10 till 5 every day and she'd show up at like 4 and and just say hi, maybe sing a song. Right, right. You know, um, so it wasn't, um, you know, coming from a jazz background where in, in jazz you really work together. Right, you, right. You, you build a kinship and you build a family and then you create out of that family, right? Yeah, and, yeah. And this was more like, you're going to learn your part, and when I'm ready, I'm going to sing with you. Right. So it's it hard to know, you know. And, and the first tour we did, um, I think it had been quite a long time between the recording process and the gigs, and she mm -hmm. hadn't really wanted to get involved on the, on the, on the rehearsals. So... Um, she didn't really know the music too well, <laughs> even though she'd written, she'd definitely written it, the chords, right, right. And, you know, everything. It's just she'd forgotten it. Wow. So, so, so it's hard to kind of gauge, at, you know, at that point, yeah. at, the, at the start of it. But what, what really, when I realised how incredible she was, was more when we went on the next tour, and we were on the tour bus. And um, I ended up with the bunk at the back next to the lounge area. Okay. Um, so if they were partying, then I couldn't sleep, you know. Right, but yeah. what would usually happen is that we'd party for an hour and then everyone would go to bed. Or, you know, the, any anyone, you know, the guests on the bus would get kicked off, mm -hmm. party a bit longer while the bus is moving, then most of the band would go to bed. Amy would not sleep that much, um, so she generally wants to just chill with, you know, chill and play some music with Dale at the end of at the end of the day. And so quite often on tour, I'd end up sort of falling asleep hearing Amy and Dale jamming. And, and she'd be saying, oh, what about this song? And it'd be some country and Western thing that I'd never heard of. And Dale knew it and he'd be calling out the chords for her. And he'd, Dale would have his um, acoustic, um, acoustic bass to play right. like a like little Hofner, I think he had. And 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 Amy would just play along and sing all this stuff. And that's when I realized that, that how special she was. Oh right. A, a know, moment so. the fans don't see, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just just kind of hearing her singing in complete comfort away from away from the importance of the business. No business at all. Just just hanging out and singing and i what i realized with her is you know that what does what the fans see is her incredible lyric writing you know okay. she you know in into you know she's kind of invented words right mm -hmm. <laughs> um and you know musically the first album was quite jazzy and the second one was motown right so right. Um, you know and then and subsequently to her doing Motown, every artist decided they'd do a Motown album. Yeah. You know, so she, she's kind of spearheaded that, but it, she spearheaded a revival rather than it being a, bring a, a whole new type of music. Mm -hmm. um, but I think apart from all of that, what she was musically really gifted at was phrasing. Oh, okay. And so I, and I, I think that things like rehab, it's the, the, the song rehab the chorus is really flat there's mm -hmm. no backbeat and and i've heard people doing covers of that tune and quite often it doesn't work very well right and it's it's all down to her phrasing and i think you know listening to her in the back of the bus there were several times where i got the you know the the pinpricks up the back of my yeah. head yeah that, that's the time that phrasing you know and I, right. and I definitely found that on stage as well. And for for me personally, when a musician can tap in 
to my spirit directly like that and, and cause a, a physical reaction, that's that's being really anointed, right? Mm, yeah. So that's, and, that's, and where, it, that's where it works for me. You, you were featured heavily in the in the video to rehab, which is pretty cool. Tell tell us about mm. that shoot. How long was how that? Many was, days oh and... yeah, that was my first day's work. That was before I just remembered. That was before the rehearsal. <laughs> oh really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. They, I think that's the first day's work. They said there'll be a, a car to pick you up at six a.m. Okay. Um, bring your baritone, and have you got some pajamas? Like, <laughs> no, sorry, I don't wear pajamas. <laughs> Oh, uh, <laughs> have you got anything a bit, a little bit similar? Right. Like, well, I've got this kind of Indian suit, you know, that I that I bought in Manchester for years ago. It's like a like a like a kind of flowy kind of shirt and trousers. I'm like, yeah, that sounds good. Good. Bring that. Bring that. Okay. So I six a.m. car arrives. Got my Indian suit. Got my baritone sax. Get driven into Portland Street, where this this facility is that the BBC have used, and it's like a it's like a very old Victorian grand house. Okay. Um, with you know quite a big house with a basement, and there's like a, I mean it's it doesn't look like it's been used for anything but film shoots for years. Um, and there's like in the basement is like a private hospital, um, but dusty everywhere, kind of create strange vibe. They've got this Hollywood director in with, with, you know, all of his setup. And when we arrive, the director is, um, sort of shaking his head because the story that the, you know, the, the, the action board thing that he's been right. working on for six months is just had to be ripped up because Amy's like, no, we're having my band in the video. Oh, <laughs> right <laughs> um, there. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so he kind of has this uh, whole thing laid out and she's like, no, it's uh, what I want is like the band, the specials. Do you remember the specials? Yeah. 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 yeah it's like, like a ska band, yeah. British one and, and all their videos, the whole band would be in them. And she's like, I just want, you know, we'll do anything you like, but I want the band to be in, every, in everything, like the specials. Um, oh, and I want them to be wearing pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> or, or an Indian Indian style suit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it, as it turned out, um, Jay Phelps, the trumpet player, didn't wear pajamas either. So he had like an African suit. So it kind of worked really well. Right, right. Um, and then some of the guys had pajamas and then the stylist went off to Marks and Spencer's to buy some pajamas for the other guys. Um, and then we spent 18 hours. Wow. So I don't know what time we finished, but late, 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 late. Um, and if you didn't know the song, you knew it by then after hearing it. So yeah, I mean, that. you know, I, yeah. I, I, so what I learned a long time ago is that for a horn player, trumpet, sax, if you mine, it looks right. shit. You have to oh, play. Okay. Oh really? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and it's 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 a bitch because you know, especially trumpet. You know, it's 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 a smack in the face, and playing quietly is even harder. Mm. But if you don't, then it just you know, you can, anyone can see that your miming's not real. Okay. Because you you know your body changes shape when you play. Oh, okay. Yeah. You know, um, and you end up. It's just weird if you don't actually play. You end up pressing all the wrong buttons and, and you, your heart's not in it. Mm -hmm. So I've always, since finding out really early, I had a um, had a big success in the pop world with a band in, in Manchester in the 90s. And we, I found out really early that, that miming on a horn doesn't work. So for those whole 18 hours, I was playing the tune. Wow. <laughs> with a baritone sax above my head it wasn't <laughs> wow. it's quite hard work yeah. it's an ordeal yeah <laughs> but it was kind of fun you know amy, amy was on side with everything we're just sort of like a bunch of musicians together and i mm -hmm. thought and the video looks great oh yeah it's they know the shit out of it right right now here in the states at least when i was growing up the grammys american music awards had to be the show you watched as a music lover you performed on the Brit Awards. That's that's a huge ordeal, a huge deal too, right? It is, yeah. Um, yeah. 
And I think that, you know, from our culture, the Brits are the biggest one. Okay. Um, so, like, we're in the last few years, it's it's become more apparent to European culture that what the Grammys are and what they stand for, and, and it's actually just started to become come on our TV. Okay. But back at that time, the Grammys were only known about by a few musicians, and our big show was the Brits. Okay. And it's so it's televised in, and it's main, you know, it's it's on a sort of 7 p.m. on the main channel, mm. you know, um, and there's a live audience of thousands. So it's a, and it's, so it's a really big deal, yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I had a funny, th- funny experience of that when um, initially I wasn't booked on that gig. And then, um, so I, I had a studio session with a big band that I was running. I was running like a, an avant-garde big band. Okay. And we were and and I think that day we were recording um a kind of twelve tone pro- sort of project of mine. Mm-hmm. Um and and I was, and they're like, Can you do this gig? And I was like, Yeah, love I'd love to do the gig. Great. The problem is I've got a studio session in the day. And they're like, Okay, um, we need you to do sound check. I was like, Yeah, cool. Um, can we find a way of getting me there quickly and back to the studio quickly? So we found um, a taxi company that have motorbikes. Oh, so so I was I had to say to the session I was like, right, I'm 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 away for about an hour. Carry on without me. This motorbike turns up, helmet on. Um, someone had a sax for me at the Brit Awards. Okay, was across town, got, and and the, the taxi driver stayed outside. Went in, got there, and and we did the sound check. Picked up someone's horn, did the sound check, got back on the bike, whizzed back to the studio session. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I felt like I'd arrived at this point. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You were get you were getting special treatment, and yeah. yeah. Where, um, where's and where's the Brit Awards uh, held? Um, it was in what's that area called? Um, oh, try try and think. It's West London, Earl's Court. Oh, okay. Earl's Court, and Earl's Court is a big, big conference center. Yeah, I, I've seen the name um, in concerts, and yeah, it's yeah, well known, yeah. So I remember getting back there, and all of the um, the the clothing people going, "Oh my God, so I'm so glad you're here because we're about to go on." <laughs> and like, I mean, people fluff, fluffing me, lots right, of fluffing. Right. Um, <laughs> and then we went, we went on stage, and three thousand people screamed. And it, it felt like, you know, those, um, I don't know, what's, what's a good example? The, um, the Beatles, the Beatles, you know, the yeah. Beatles from the sixties where just, you can't hear and play cause everyone's right. screaming. It was like that. We could, we literally couldn't hear our own monitors for the screaming. Wow. So, so that's the kind of, uh, the night you're, you're calling all the family members the next day, <laughs> tell them what, yeah. what happened. <laughs> Oh, you just sort of go with the flow. It's because it's funny on those occasions. It's really exciting, mm-hmm. but at the same time, it's someone else. It's not. It's not my music. I'm yeah. just a hired gun. You know. I'm, right, I'm, right. You know, like I'm a very well trained piece of meat. You yeah. know. <laughs> I, I've heard. I've heard other musicians say similar things. You know, it's. I'm just adding to the, to the artist's yeah. uh, painting there, and yeah. Yeah, and I mean, I, guess, I was yeah. at that time. I think they just wanted to have a bit more presence. So they asked me to come and join the show. Right. Right. You know, now um, getting, but, getting um, towards Amy, Amy Winehouse and Prince having that mutual respect and everything. I saw a clip. I don't, I don't know if you've seen it when, when Amy, I think she was here in the States on MTV and they, they let her know that Prince said, Oh, he's a big fan. He would love to have her join her at the O2 out in London. And I, I felt, I'm sure you guys went, I mean, you, you personally knew her, but I, you know, seeing her alive and, and her reaction to that was like, wow, what, what a loss. Yeah. But yeah. Now, now did she come back to the band and said, Hey, you believe this Prince wants to jam with me? Um, no, but the, to be fair though, she had a lot of stuff going on okay. and like she was quite, um, quite minimal about you know just saving the right information for the right people Mm. so the band was just music and that would have been you know it's 
kind of music, but it's kind of business as well. And to be honest, that might have been after I was with her. Oh, okay. Um, I remember hearing that interview where where she's. I think almost. I think actually she mentions it on the on the Grammys thing interview. Oh, okay. I think I saw it on there. Um, definitely heard her talking about that. But it's it's beautiful the way that you know we're all humans, right? We're all just people, and mm -hmm. and quite often the the what I've seen is like the 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 musicians that are the most connected are often able to be connected because their egos in you know in a reduced capacity. Mm, um, okay. So so you, I find that when I meet the most incredible musicians, they're generally so calm about it that you you have to do a double take to check that it's actually them. <laughs> right. Um, and it's it's lovely that kind of thing. Obviously, you know, with with Amy and Prince, it's not just that they're the most incredible musicians, they're also the most incredible business people. Mm, yeah. And so that that brings a different flavour. Um. And yeah, it's lovely when you when one person in that position has such a great regard for one of the others. Like, so I'll give you an example. Like, so Amy didn't talk about that, and and actually, when I was with Prince, we didn't end up talking to him. And you know, as you know, he's really shy, so he wouldn't right. want to talk to anyone. But um, Bob Geldof isn't shy, okay. <laughs> and right. and so the the first time I met met Geldof was in uh, a recording session, and. Um, and just to clear the air a little bit, I think I'd just flown back from a, a crazy party in India and he was like, so how's your deli belly? And I said, I haven't had it yet. And he said, you will, <laughs> <laughs> you will. <laughs> right. And it's like, so I heard you worked with, with Winehouse, you know, how was that? Cause I'd never spoken to her, right. you know, and that's so, so, and, and I think, and then he told me a story about when he'd spoken to Prince Oh, okay. and, and, and how surreal it had been, you mm. know, because Prince is kind of this whole, whole different kind of character. Right, but, but right. you know, so he'd, he'd spoke, he's spoken to almost everyone. You know, he's so he's so well connected, that guy. But one of the people he'd never spoken to at that point was Winehouse. And he's like, so tell me about Winehouse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, how, how about the uh, where Bob Geldof, uh, the reunion of the Boomtown Rats? I saw an outdoor gig. Where Where was that that you played? So yeah, we played the Isle of Wight festival. Oh, a huge festival! Yeah, which, yeah, huge, yeah. yeah. Um, and that was their first gig in thirty years. Wow! Yeah, yeah. So like they like a long time ago, they'd kind of split up, and he he went to do his TV thing and his you know um, his lobbying stuff, and and then he started his own band, and and. Um, the Boomtown Rats carried on without him. Um, and at some point, they formed a reunion and they were looking for... A, they, uh, the way I understand it, they were looking for a horn player that could give it some some welly. Okay, give welly. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, um, and Bob asked his drummer in his, in his, in his personal band mm -hmm. to recommend someone. And at the time, I'd been working with a, a rock and roll group. Um, and it was a, like a, a band that had been going for 30 years. I'd been with them about 10 of those years. And, and it was known for, for really playing it, playing dirty, getting in there and, and right. sucking it through them. And so I developed a whole persona to playing that way, growling and massive big sound and, and sucking it to them. Um, so the drummer from that band recommended me to Bob as, you know, said this, you know, you don't need, because, you know, it's funny that like sax is very adaptable, but not every sax player is adaptable. So it's funny when people ask me to get a dep because I'm not entirely sure which facet of my personality they need most mm -hmm. and therefore who I, who I need to dep to. Um, so with this, they just wanted someone that would really lay into it and, and give it give it some welly. Um, so I got I got the call. I did a studio session. The funny thing in the studio session, um, they they got us all set up, sound checks and everything. They, and then we um, I think we 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 worked through the parts, and I just worked orally. Bob was like, right now I want bada, 
right? Ba da, great, record it. Ba da. Um, and then they got to the solo and they said, right, so this this is like, um, it's in homage almost. He didn't use that word, but it's right. like a tribute of our most famous song, Rat Trap. So mm-hmm. we just want you to do a solo like Rat Trap. Um, I was like, okay, that's awesome. I don't know Rat Trap though. Mm, okay. And Bob's like, what? You know, Rat Trap, you know, like our famous song. I'm really sorry. Could he play it for me? What? You don't know our most famous song? Everyone knows our most famous song. You don't know our most famous song? <laughs> like, I'm really sorry. I don't know your most favourite song. Can you hum it to me? And so they hummed it to me and then I played that. And they're like, yeah, that's it. Perfect. <laughs> wow. And then we finished the, the, the tenor take. And then mm-hmm. Bob's like, OK, now I just want you to double everything on alto. And I was like, okay, from memory, I've only done it once. And the producer was like, Bob, that's kind of hard because alto's in a different key. All the the notes are in a different place. And Bob's like, ah, fuck it. He can do anything there. He can do anything. He's just come back from India. He's played with Amy Winehouse, played with Prince. He can do anything. Go for it. So I picked the alto up and did it in one take. Wow. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but you'd, you'd um, prefer not to have to go that route right you'd rather have it <laughs> um to be honest i when someone's being being really supportive um oh, okay. you know that's a big part of it right it's like yeah. if if he'd have been a bit of an arsehole about it right then i'd probably want to go and and work it out but right. i think it's it's you know i'm still learning how to work in in the studio both as you know I'm, i've i've become quite all right at it as a musician but i'm still learning how to work in the studio as a producer oh that's slipping down um sorry bear with me well he, he gave you a lot of uh compliments right there before yeah so. he gave me a yeah. lot of confidence right there and, and the compliments and it gave me confidence and then as a result um I just gave it my best shot, and and it might it might have been that it wasn't accurate enough, but quite often in a recording, you're looking to put vibe onto a track mm-hmm. rather than accuracy. Okay, and it's it's always a balance, right? To be between getting accuracy and vibe, because you know if there's if it's all vibe and no accuracy, then it's got to be a jam album. Right, but it you know, and if it's the other way round, then it's people aren't going to listen to it after one take. You know, if it, if it's all accuracy and no vibe, then no one's going to listen to it. So it's it's all about getting the right balance, isn't it? So mm-hmm. uh, I think that I just as a musician stepping into that environment, I had enough accuracy in me, and they gave me the vibe to just crack into it. Um, so, so yeah, we did the yeah. session. After the session, weirdly, actually, they they I had a gig later in the day, and they like right, we know you got a gig, um, but I was like, I've got a bit of time, so they like, do you want to hang? So I made made myself a cup of tea, just wanted okay. to sort of hang and chill a little bit before going to the gig. As I was making a cup of tea, Bob sort of creeps into the kitchen with his guitar. <laughs> you know, I've I've got this I've got this little idea. Uh-huh. Do you want to? to work on it with me while you're here yeah no worries yeah cool let's do it um and then he sets about writing this song there and then oh okay and then saying can you play this bit and and so you know i was still i was just playing his ideas um but it's i thought it's really interesting because he's bob bob's not in any way a trained musician he's you know um so he's sort of, he doesn't have any concept. He just hears, like, you know, he hears it and he sings it. Right. You know, and then his musical director goes, oh, uh, there's a three, four bar there. Can we turn it into four, four? And Bob's like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's really interesting to see that. And right. then obviously that had gone well. And then a couple of weeks later, they're like, uh, we're going to do a show. Do you want to come do the show? And that's what, when Isla White happened. And it, Isla White was, for me, very surreal, um, mainly because when I was a, a kiddie in the 80s watching TV, right. there was this, this big thing, Live Aid, right? 
Yeah, yeah. And it was huge, huge TV and a, a huge international thing. And the guy that set it all up and ran it and the face oh. of it was Bob Geldof. Right. And so he was like, in, his face was imprinted on my, in my mind, you know. And, and here I am in front of about 30,000 people with this face inches from mine going, go on, Aaron, go on, you can do it. Go on, Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's something. <laughs> I was like, I can, but this is really, you know, I've got this icon from my youth right in my face shouting at me while I stand center stage in front of 30,000 people, all of whom know this solo better than I. Mm. <laughs> not all of them, but a lot of them. And, yeah, I, yeah. and, you know, the gig was not just play the sax, mm -hmm. but play the original solo. Wow, yeah. Again, it's a, a trained piece of meat, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and you handled it well, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's really fun. Um, looking back, I can see myself counting bars. <laughs> <laughs> I, had, I had these in-ear monitors in, and the mix was horrific, and I didn't. I was completely disconnected from the world. Mm -hmm. And I was just going, shit, have I done that bit? I hope I've done that bit. You know, there's like the, the I, I call it the red mist. It's like the red mist comes down and, and suddenly you can't see clearly and you can't hear clearly and your memory goes to shit. And you just hope that all, you've done enough practice and that the body will take care of it. You know, right. like if you go through the same walk every day, in the end, you've forgotten that you've gone because your body has got on, gotten on with doing the walk. Yeah, an auto or you pilot, drive yeah. the same way and you can't remember how you drove home because yeah. you, you went into just animal mode. Right. And I find if I do enough practice for those environments, then I get on stage, the red mist comes down mm -hmm. and my body plays the sax. Right. That, that, that's interesting because, you know, about driving the car and everything, I actually looked that up one time to see what, what – what causes that? There, there is some explanation, and you, you probably explained it perfectly. I yeah. wonder if it's that. I think that's where. I think that if if you think about, you can train a pet dog mm -hmm. by repetition, and I think you can probably train the animal part of ourselves by repetition, and I think that's how we end up being really good at some kind of technique whether it's playing a scale on sax or a chord on piano or, or really good at golf or something you know there's always a luck element but it's it's always combined with us with a trained skill right. and i think that we're not training our brain you know our conscious brain i think we're training our subconscious brain which is the part dealing with the animal part of our body that's it that's definitely that's interesting yeah Hey, we got to circle back. Uh, I know we, we talked about Prince because that's that's a, a big part, you know, great connection. I mean, we have the connection with Prince in the musical community. Uh, how, did, how did you first become involved with Prince? So um, it was, you know, my, my story of my connection with Prince is very limited and I don't want to oversell it. Um, do you remember he came to London and did a record yeah. 21 nights in London? Yeah, yeah. Had the press conference. Yeah. 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 Um, and for us, that was a relatively new venue and artists had done a single night. You know, it's 23,000 capacity and you do a night. You don't, you know, it's very presumptuous to do 21 nights. Yeah. <laughs> you know? um, so it's like, that's that's crazy. And then um, I just heard on the scene that he'd been, his people had been contacting artists in the UK. Mm-hmm. Does that, do you want to, you know, he, he kind of wanted to hear what UK musicians had to say. And, and I, I now know that he's quite an ethical, principled person. Mm -hmm. And so his way of getting to hear British artists was to say, would you come and do a support slot for, with me and I'll pay okay. you. Okay. And, you know, um, so it's very ethical, I think. You know, and just and that same thing of wanting to experience the artists in first hand rather than just listening to them, you know, right, and, right. And, and get a feel for people in real life. So at that point, I'd finished with Amy and I'd moved on to working with Beverly Knight. Who just got who, married, right? Uh, I think cool. a couple of years ago, but yeah, oh, okay. relatively recent. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, and so, yeah, she, 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 she hadn't met the dude at, at the time. Um, um, Bev is 
I think probably, you know, one of the best singers this country's produced, mm. you know, and, and yeah. definitely coming from the sort of gospel heritage and going into soul music. We sadly, we don't have a, a great um, scene for soul music here. You know, the, you, you, you hear a lot of soul music at parties, right? but there's a not a great industry for it here compared to rock and pop. Um, but Bev is incredible and her, her, her approach to professionalism is incredible. She'll do a three hour show mm. and nail everything, you know, she'll, she'll send the band off for a break in the middle and she'll go to do an acoustic set Yeah, and she'll just nail ridiculous. everything. She's really down to earth. She's lovely, genuine with, with her audience the whole time. It's all, it's the real deal. Um, so I was working with her, which she just done. Um, uh, a Motown album, right. <laughs> and she wanted to, the right horns to to promote it. So I, I joined her and had a similar experience with with joining that. They were like, you know, are you available on Tuesday? Yeah, can you get horn section together? I think so. Right, we'll send you the music, and we, you know, we we spent four days learning to play the album, right? And we we met up at the studio and. Um, uh, and then she arrived and she's like, right, young man, Aaron, what, what would you like to try first? And we played through the whole album without any music. And they said, great, you're hired. Wow. So um, did you, um, do, playing with Prince, um, I know Beverly Knight did some of the stuff there on the O2 gig. Did you do the Indigo Nightclub? Is that where you yeah, played? Yeah, so or? this is what, that's exactly what happened. So Bev accepted the invitation to do a support show. Okay. So we did our support show. And then uh, Prince kind of gave us a box to hang out in so we could watch his show. I got to meet um, Maceo that night, which Great was for guy. me, yeah. like much bigger than meeting Prince. You know, Maceo right. Parker's like an idol for me. And to get to meet him and, and discover that he's just a really lovely guy. Right, right. <laughs> you know, just the guy who's like, oh, look, help yourself to fruit. That These, these are the good ones, you know. <laughs> um, right. And then... Uh, we after the show, the management had said, "Look, something might occur after. We can't tell you what it is, and we can't tell you about it. But it would be great if you would just stay and see what would happen." Mm -hmm. And we waited an hour, and the trombone player I'd booked for the gig was like, "Aaron, I've, I've had enough of this. I want to go home. Can I go home?" And I was like, "Yeah, you know, I can't keep you here. You can go." Trumpet player stayed. He went about half hour later. Oh. You, would you like to come and play at, in the party in the after show right yeah great let's do it let's do it so we go over to another venue in the same on the same site the indigo right. um and there's like three thousand people out of the twenty three thousand that came to the main show three thousand have bought tickets for that and i i now know it was the first time that they'd made that experiment of actually making the after show party mm -hmm. a public event right you know and I, and I didn't you know but i didn't know at the time that um prince would always do his money show and then just for spirit just for the music have a have a part have a music party yeah. after some and usually it'd be completely private and he'd only tell his the people that he trusted his fans that he trusted Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a, such a beautiful endeavour, you know, a beautiful thing to do. Um, but on this occasion, it was different. It was public tickets, so anyone could go. And it, he'd been doing this every time. And as, as my understanding goes, most of those nights, people had just stood there listening to the album on the on the intercom. Okay. So it was shit, because yeah. he just didn't feel that it, it didn't feel it was happening. Or, or maybe the support band, you know, the artist that had come and done the support set, he might have asked them if they'd gone and do the after show. When, when did the after show? He wasn't digging it. So that's it. Yeah. Disappointment you know? for the fans, but yeah, yeah. for real. <laughs> um, so he, he'd never made an appearance on the after show. So we went and played, and we just played the set. So it's a little bit, I mean, it's all right, but it was a little bit weird because these people have just seen us play this set and we're playing the same set. You yeah, know, didn't yeah. do any other songs, we just played the set, which felt a little bit odd. 
Um, and the sound was brilliant. His his crew were amazing, really looked after us. And then we finished the set, and it was even more embarrassing because they we just stopped. They we were asked to stay on stage. They didn't put any music on, and there was a bit of discussion going on on the other side off the wings. And but we as a band were just looking at sort of three thousand people going. Yeah. <laughs> you know what's gonna happen now what are we doing yeah yeah what are we doing and um the md says right we're gonna do that that one um the one you know the one with the silo in from earlier in the set and i'm like okay so we're gonna do a song for the third time to the same audience <laughs> without jamming it without opening it up just the same way right so it's like this is embarrassing now okay um so we play the song it gets to the guitar solo it's not our guitarist playing the solo. Ah, yeah. And the place erupted. You know, like just, it literally felt like 3,000 people levitating. That's something, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he came on, he played a solo, he went off, he sent Maceo on to jam with us for a bit. Maceo came on, went off. Some of the other horns came on, went off. Eventually, all all of his four horns came on, uh, with a few of his band. Um, they had this little trick they played, where they um, we in horn sections we have this thing called a solly. You know what that is? Uh, not the word solly. So solly means a pre-prepared um, feature. Okay. Where it sounds like a solo, but everyone's playing together in harmony. Okay. That's so like a like a party piece, really. Right, right. And so, so the and it, it was about sixteen bars long. So, so Maceo and the guys started playing this solly, and me and my trumpet players trying to catch up with it. And we're just like, that's really hard. <laughs> How can we jump to that? And we're like, ugh, ugh. right. And then they go for it again. We're trying. We still can't get it. Like, <laughs> um, and then suddenly there's a technician at our side, and he says, "Hey guys, have a beer." Uh -huh. Here's a couch just for you. Enjoy the show. We're like, ah, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so, and the, all the band had had the same experience at the same time. It's like, you know, we're going to take it from here, guys. Right, right. Sit down on the stage, enjoy a beer on us. Your gig's done, and and you sit down and and you watch Prince do a, just have a party for a, for an hour. And I, I'm not sure if that was the night they recorded it and he included in a, in a release with a book from the Indigo. I don't know if it was that night or. Now that's a strange one. So I, I know that they did like, you know, we basically, we, we, I think he wanted us to come back and do the rest of the shows. Okay. Which was an amazing compliment and we were busting for it. Um, for some reason that I don't really think is the real reason we didn't do that we just did one show okay but we did yep. go back in and, and the second time we did it it was more like a jam session and it was amazing we, you know both band both his band and ours 23 yeah. people just played together for an hour wow. that's yeah. amazing and he uh, on that time he'd sent a message saying do you want to come and play the after party and if you do please bring the whole horn section ah okay <laughs> so, yeah. and it but you know um and I, I'm aware that some stuff was recorded, but um, I mean, even on the day, people, someone texted me and said, I recorded, I bootlegged your gig. You know, I've got it. Mm -hmm. And then it turned out that that had been deleted. And I know that Prince had employed a, a team of hackers that would spend every day deleting bootlegs. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He was extremely tough on that. Yeah. Yeah. So. Good for him. Yeah. So yeah. I, you know, I, I got that book one time hoping that it would have the discs. It didn't have the disc. I sent it back. So if anyone's got a recording of that night, I'd love to hear it. I got, I've got to look up because it was an official release, but it, it was of his band, but I'll, I'll figure mm. out the, the, uh, I'll, I'll relay it to you about what date it was. Cause I know Shelby Johnson, she was singing on the gig. That's and, right. That rings yeah. a bell. Actually someone I did just, this rings a bell now. Someone recently, surreptitiously passed me something and I've, I've have been listening to it and there is yeah. a bit of that there is a bit she, of that she sang the song misty blue that was that's uh, right yeah yeah, yeah, yeah 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 so there is an official recording i just don't know the date so yeah yeah 
I think, yeah, I think all of that stuff was recorded. Right. Um, and well, I mean, that's the, we were amazed that the crew that he had for the after party was, was so much better than our entire crew for our touring thing. You know, like, yeah, yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah, he, he, he definitely was a, it was a first, first class operation. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I got, I got a quick Maceo Parker story for you. Um, awesome. My, my wife used to do radio promotion. She had her own company and she worked for Maceo's son, Corey Parker. So we went to see Prince in Montreal for the rainbow children tour in 2001 so right before the show starts, I'm in, I walk up, I think I went to the men's room and came out and right in the hallway is Maceo Parker with uh, his manager, Natasha. He's all dap in the suit with his horn, just amongst people. And the stage is like, he's on the third level. So we started talking. I was telling my wife work for your son and you know, he was cool and everything. And Natasha, it's always nice. Um, but the lights dim all of a sudden Maceo, from the top level of the hockey arena, 20,000 20, seat, has to walk down the stairs all the way down to the stage playing his saxophone, just the saxophone, and not fall and break his neck. Yeah. <laughs> I've never, never seen that. Yeah, it was it was challenging, but he, he wow. did it. Yeah. yeah. So I remember well, that's... him being um, backstage, and at the time, Prince was going through um, that stage where he got back into religion. Yeah, so there's, goodness, yeah, so there's no drink backstage, and it's all subdued purple lighting. So someone oh, okay. had the job of covering all of the lights with a purple gel, right. and it was all kind of very subdued. And um, I remember hearing this alto player playing furious, furious bebop, uh -huh. and and they, you know, like going, I could hear it going up and down the corridors, and at one point, like. This, this face appears. Huh, huh. Do you know when dinner's ready? <laughs> oh, I think it's in a half hour. Okay. Boosh. And it and it's it is it's Maceo warming up. Right, right. Whilst wow. whilst running around the corridors playing the most furious bebop. <laughs> <laughs> and at that point I went, right, yeah, he, he gets what his stage thing is. But that's yeah. not all there is. Yeah, we've seen him a couple times. Maybe his own band, Greg Boyer, was in the band, and Ski Curtis, right, on yeah, Greg. Like Bruno Spate. Yeah, just you know, great, great musicians. And and James Brown. You know, I met James Brown and Wilson Pickett back in eighty two, eighty three. They were on tour. Maceo was in the band, but here I am, probably eighteen years old. I don't realize, you know, I'm amongst these legends. Right? Yeah. I could have taken. I'm backstage with James Brown. I could have taken advantage of, you know, finding out more. But you know. Yeah. Probably met Maceo, yeah. And I think sometimes when you're young and innocent like that, yeah, you get given these opportunities because you're not going to make a fuss about it because you don't know. That's true, yeah. I was, know, uh, sometimes that naivety means you're, you're a safe person to have around. Right. Yeah, I saw James Brown in hair curlers. <laughs> so, <yeah>. Right, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's but, a beautiful thing. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> So, hey, hey, listen, listen, Aaron, I got to thank you um, so much for finally we're meeting. We talked and you were in New York and unfortunately we didn't meet. And um, you, you're just a great guy and great musician. Nylon man. We're going to be playing it here on our program. Beautiful. Thanks for playing it. Yeah. And, okay. and for those watching it, we'll have the links, Aaron's links, AaronLadar.com and Bandcamp. You can. First of all, get his music, support support an independent artist. And uh, if he's touring around in your neck of the woods, go see him and his great band. Uh, we'll also have this interview, the audio with your music on our Mixcloud station. And all the podcasts, the audio will be there, Spotify, you name it. So you'll be out there. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's been a joy. Yeah, yeah it's great. Hey, a quick one question. And this is off the wall. We're big fans me and my wife of Brit Box and the British shows. You have a recommendation, anything on the telly out there that you've been getting into or too busy? Yeah, I don't watch a lot of TV, but, and I prefer Gordon Ramsay when he's in America telling, okay. telling Americans <laughs> to clean their fridge. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, we'll leave it at that. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> yeah. So th thanks, Aaron, so much. Brilliant. Thank, thank you, Joe. Okay.